All right, everybody, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Aaron Brown, and I'm with an organization called No More Freeways, and we just sued the federal government. <laughs> Um, I've got a couple notes, and then we're going to have a really amazing group of community speakers. Um, but before that, we're going to do a land acknowledgement. So uh, first up is Tad. Tad is an organizer with Sunrise PDX. Uh, they are a citizen of the Jamestown Squalalum tribe from the Cook Card Cardonsky family. They are a labor organizer, wobbly, and indigenous climate justice warrior, and will be providing a stolen land acknowledgement. So please give it up for Tad. That's Jonathan. That's not Tad. There's Tad. Testing? Cool. Why do we acknowledge stolen land? History is a set of contingent events, and the empire of these United States is contingent on stolen land and stolen people. With my white privilege, I cannot speak to the lived experience of anti-blackness, nor can I speak on behalf of the indigenous people whose land was hacked away at to carve out Portland. That would be the various discrete bands of Chinook-speaking people along the Columbia River and Kalapuya-speaking people along the Willamette. I can only speak to my own viewpoint based on my lived experience as a working-class citizen of the Jamestown Sklalem tribe. The indigenous name for ourselves is Nusplayum, and we are indigenous to the Salish Sea on what is now called the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. Pre-capitalist contact, we managed our wealth in a ceremonial institution called a potlatch. We would give away most or all of our wealth to everyone in the community. Wealth was conceptualized beyond material commodity. One could give away a song or a prayer or a promise or anything that you thought your community would value. It was given in a way in good faith. And this gift economy was a recognition that abundance comes from a mutualistic relationship with our surrounding ecosystem. Society viewed the most rich and powerful as those that could give the most to their communities. Hoarding resources in this lens disrespected the intricate relationship our ancestors maintain with the land through generations. Colonial records implicate capitalism's adversarial relationship to other walks of life. Gilbert Malcolm Sprout, the so-called academic authority on savage life for Queen Victoria, writes to Her Majesty, it is not possible that the Indians can become industrious with any good result while under the influence of the potlatch. It is opposed to the values of a good Christian capitalist society and contributes to the savage Indians' state of barbarism and degradation. When salmon cannery bosses brought the concept of wages, my ancestors would work harder than the other workers so they could save up their money and throw a potlatch. Then they stopped showing up to work altogether after that because why go to work? The potlatch allowed them to choose when they worked and when they stayed at home. And this self-sufficiency and united labor force was in direct contrast to the agenda of the salmon cannery bosses. And so they banned the potlatch and made our language illegal. They forced us into reservations and they were free to murder any native they found off reservation. They violently assimilated us into the land of the free and the home of the brave. Europe's rich bourgeoisie tradition was thrust down our throat. Any white man was free to extract the resources and exploit their workers by hoarding the excess value of their labor for profit. The so-called rule of law under this liberal capitalism criminalized our existence, replacing our pious stewardship of this spaceship we share called Earth with the haphazard patchwork of plundered property. Each person partaking in indigenous conquest, a king of their newfound castle and values around this collective, around mutual aid, 
and around respect of nature were replaced with an irrational adherence to an individualist ideology that ascertains competition between rational actors is somehow a good system of governance. What the hell? Is racism rational? Is guarding fresh, clean garbage at gunpoint as people starve together in the third unprecedented ice storm in five years rational? Is spending trillions on bombing babies rational? Is building an unregulated economic system among thieves rational? Is shooting out CO2 when it says, science says it is killing us rational? Our founding fathers, they are saints among slavers. Their initial inclination in our founding documents was to emphasize the pursuit of property. It was synonymous to the pursuit of happiness in their eyes. And their exclusive interpretation of democracy stains our founding documents with the scars of slavery. Freedom, equality, and justice. These ideologically liberal tenets are surmised through the capitalist greed's tainted lens. Tainted lens. Democracy now acts as a blank check, signed off by the fraction of the working masses. For a capitalist with a blue tie or a red tie to cash in on the value of your labor to a lesser extent than the other. But however, we did not vote for ExxonMobil. We did not vote for this freeway expansion. We did not vote for climate change, and yet all these things have materialized. Why? We sit at the precipice of the complete breakdown of Earth's natural systems, yet the neoliberal hellscape drenched in ice and scorched by wildfire can do nothing but implement neoliberal market solutions. Why? It's because we live in a dictatorship, a dictatorship ruled by the financial capital and imperialist interests, interests who are entirely dependent on environmental degradation, Interests who implement structural violence solely to proliferate profit instead of protecting people. This economic system externalizes harm on the powerless and the societal superstructures built by this free market farce is set on extermination of those who can no longer just keep on taking it. Our dictatorship will drag your th good name through shit in order to justify the inherent contradictions of their liberal capitalism. Our dictatorship will shoot a deaf indigenous woodcarver in the back for not hearing orders. Our dictatorship will kill you in your sleep and arrest the cop that missed. Our dictatorship will kidnap indigenous families in the middle of the night because they came from the other side of an imaginary border. And our dictatorship will continue to subsidize fossil fuels in the face of a mass extinction event. And our dictatorship will steal this land that we stand on right now a second time from the community of beautiful black people that built themselves a little slice of prosperity in the name of freeway expansion. Where is the justice? Where is the justice for Breonna Taylor, for Patrick Kimmons, or for Kevin Peterson Jr.? Where is the justice for the families at the border? Where is our climate justice? Where is our transportation justice? I'll tell you where. There is no justice on stolen land. Thank you very much, Ted. Appreciate it. I, I find uh, stolen land acknowledgments to be uh, very grounding and humbling and a reminder of uh, the importance of thinking with moral clarity about what our future must hold and how we must work together. And, um, in, in that framework, we're here to, to celebrate our efforts to establish a new moral ground. Um, we're here to celebrate our community resiliency, our commitment to decarbonization, our commitment to a just transition, our commitment to cleaner air, our commitment to safer streets, and a brighter future. And we're here to celebrate our lawsuit in which we filed this NEPA complaint. Uh, and all of our co-plaintiffs are here to speak today, uh, including Tori. And uh, Tori Hiru is a program director at Neighbors for Clean Air. She's an advocate for environmental justice and public health. Tori is both an attorney and an organizer, and she earned her law degree from Lewis and Clark. She lives in outer Southeast Portland with her partner, a dog, and two cats. Uh, please welcome Tori.
thank you, Aaron, for setting the stage on why we're all here today and uh, to Tad for the acknowledgement of the land that we stand on. Um, so yes, as Aaron said, my name's Tori. Um, I am here today on behalf of Neighbors for Clean Air, who is one of the plaintiffs in the aforementioned lawsuit. Um, and first of all, I just want to thank all of you for being here today, um, for continuing to stand up for environmental justice, despite ODOT's attempts to steamroll any opposition at all to their freeway expansion, no matter what the community has said. Um, I also want to thank No More Freeways for bringing us together to hold this line and to demand better, which many of the people here today have been doing for almost a decade, since 2012, when this project was first initiated. So uh, ODOT's finding of that this project would pose no significant impact um, rests on the faulty assumption that the expansion of the freeway will reduce congestion, despite widespread acknowledgement from academics to the U.S. Secretary of Transportation um, that widening freeways actually can create more traffic. Um, this is just one of many ways that the agency has fudged the numbers to create the illusion that this freeway expansion will benefit this neighborhood. Uh, the original choice to route I-5 through the Albina neighborhood had a huge negative impact on a thriving black community. And expanding this freeway will not erase this racist legacy. Despite ODOT's best efforts to spin this, all of us here today know that widening a freeway through an environmental justice community will not improve air quality. This becomes especially clear right here at Tubman, where 70% of students are people of color, and air quality is already so bad that experts have recommended that student outdoor activities be limited, especially during high traffic periods, which is a lot of the time when it's I-5. Uh, PPS has already been forced to spend more than $12 million to reduce the health impacts to students and teachers while they are inside of the building. Why is this falling on our schools? The expansion will bring traffic within 30 feet of this school. According to the Health Effects Institute, the area most affected by traffic emissions adjacent to a freeway or really any major road starts at about 1,500 feet. We're learning more all the time about the correlation between roadway emissions and decreased student attendance and performance. Children are most vulnerable to the long-term impacts from traffic because their lungs are still developing. And on average, children breathe about 50% more air per pound of body weight than adults do. ODOT is insisting that this expansion won't increase air pollution because they know that no matter how hard they try, they can't justify further burdening the most vulnerable among us with more pollution. The cost of this project continues to balloon every year with the latest estimate at nearly $800 million. Imagine what else ODOT could spend that money on to adapt to our current climate reality and make active forms of transportation safer for all of us. So thank you again for your willingness to stand with us and demand more for our health, for our climate future, and for our children. Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you, Tori. Um, I had a couple of remarks. We're, we're going to bring up Joe Courtright next, our economist. But before we do, I just a couple things. One, uh, while you're here, we've got a whole bunch of postcards. We even got stamps to send those postcards. Uh, Remember during the pandemic how much fun it's been to send and receive mail? Well, this is our opportunity to send some mail to Governor Kate Brown, to Speaker Tina Kotek, to Secretary Pete Buttigieg, uh, and to Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, uh, and ask them to continue to push at ODOT and to push for an environmental impact statement. Um, if everyone in here can write one or two postcards uh, throughout before you leave today, uh, the folks over here at the table will be happy to help walk you through that. Uh, please also sign up our forms uh, and also, please eat some of the wonderful food from our friends at Snack Block that they brought here as well. Um, yeah, thank you. How, how is everyone doing? Are we like really stoked to be in person? I've misidentified about a dozen people already because I can only see like their eyes and not like their living room background from Zoom. 
uh, and it's it's just such a it's such an honor to be uh, gradually returning to being an events in person again, safely with mis masks and distance. Uh, and I can't think of a better opportunity to to reconnect with our community that we haven't had the chance to see over the last year. Uh, so I just wanted to make make it explicit that I'm I'm really grateful for everyone's attendance today. Um, so Tori spoke a little bit about how ODOT was manipulating the traffic data. Uh, and the gentleman who's about to speak next is, is ODOT's worst nightmare. Uh, Joe Courtright is an economist. Yeah, applaud for that. He is ODOT's worst nightmare. Uh, Joe Courtright is an economist and a director of Sur City Observatory, a national urban policy think tank based here in Portland. For seven years, he was one of the leaders of the fight against the Columbia River crossing, uh, and he's here to speak today about some of the specific uh, details in which we caught ODOT lying to us about the impacts this project will have on our lungs and to our planet. So please welcome Joe. Thank, thank you, Aaron, and thank everybody so much for being here. It's great to have your support. And it's so appropriate that we started with the acknowledgement of the stolen lands. But it's important to realize that the land in this neighborhood was stolen not just once, but at least twice. And it was stolen because, largely because of the work of the Oregon Department of Transportation, which starting in the 1950s built Highway 99W Interstate Avenue along the Willamette River, destroying the connection of the Albina neighborhood to the waterfront. In the 1960s, they built I-5 right behind us here, um, all the way from pa past the steel bridge clear up to the Columbia River. And that sliced right through the center of a thriving neighborhood. And not only that, but then just a few blocks north of here, they built the, north, the east end of the Fremont Bridge, which devastated another 20 or 30 blocks of this neighborhood. In 1950, 14,000 people lived in the Albina neighborhood. In 1970, after those big freeway projects, only 4,000 people lived here. This neighborhood was devastated by freeway construction because nobody wanted to live near or in the middle of uh, all this traffic. And it's ironic that ODOT is coming back and pretending that they're offering restorative justice to the neighborhood by widening the freeway. Only a highway engineer would think you could fix the problem by making the freeway bigger. But they've assured us that they're not really making the freeway very big. For years, they've been telling us they're only going to add two lanes to the road behind us here. It's going to go from four lanes to six lanes. But in the past two months, we've uncovered documents that were kept secret by the Oregon Department of Transportation that show they're planning not a six-lane freeway, not an eight-lane freeway, but a ten-lane freeway behind us here. It's 160 feet wide. It's going to come right up to the edge of the school. They're going to have to take part of the property from the school ground to build the freeway. But they tell us, don't worry. You don't have to worry about that because we're going to buffer you from that freeway because they're going to build two 1,000 foot long, 22 foot high sound walls between the school and the freeway. And to give you an idea how tall that is, 22 feet is taller than the structure of us right now. The Berlin Wall is half that, was half that high. And that's ODOT's solution to the environmental problem that they're going to create by widening the freeway. And finally, the thing I have to say is, the freeway itself is being sold as a way to solve congestion. But we know that in urban America, no freeway widening project has ever resolved a congestion problem. Houston, Texas spent several billion dollars widening the Katy Freeway to 23 lanes. And after they did, it was, took 30% longer to make trips on that freeway than it did before they widened it. There's no evidence that widening freeways ever makes traffic go away. All it does is induce more travel, and that produces more pollution. A 10-lane freeway here will produce dramatically more pollution for this neighborhood and more greenhouse gases. And there's a technical explanation for how ODOT has cooked the models here, but I'll just give you a short example that I think you all know about. About two years ago, Volkswagen and a number of other manufacturers 
were caught cheating on the software that went into their diesel cars. They rigged the software in the cars so that it would pass the tests. And even though the cars, when they were ran regularly, emitted vastly more pollution than was allowed by law, any time they were hooked up to a test, the car would recognize that and cheat on the test. And that is exactly what ODOT's engineers have done with the traffic and the pollution forecasts for this project. They've rigged the software to cheat on the test. We know we face an existential crisis with climate. And it comes to ground right here in this neighborhood at this school. And your support in fighting this project is so important to our future, to our kids' future, and to our planet's future. So thank you all. I told you he was ODOT's worst nightmare. Actually, I, I think all of us are part of a collective series of nightmares for ODOT, right? Um, so Joe's remarks just finished talking about the climate future, uh, and so I'm really grateful for Sunrise PDX. Can we give a round of applause for Sunrise? I, I have time and time again been, been so honored and grateful to have the moral clarity and the wisdom and the, and the youth energy of Sunrise, uh, which has really, you know, scared, scared the crap out of a lot of elected officials in the last couple of years. Watching, uh, watching youth climate leaders stare down elected officials in the, on the dais in public testimony and look them in the eye and ask, is this an acceptable future that you are living, giving to me and to your children? And we have eight years to decarbonize and 40% of Oregon's carbon emissions come from transportation. Uh, I've just watched bureaucrats' faces melt in the context of a three minute bit of public testimony. And Sunrise has uh, really just brought a huge amount of public resurgence and energy. And I just find all of the youth climate energy to be really an integral part of how we're talking about this project. Um, and Sharona Schneider, our next speaker, is a really great example of that. Uh, she is the co-founder of the Global Grassroots Movement, Tuesdays for Trash, that started right here in Portland. Uh, she is the chairwoman of the nonprofit Our Streets PDX, and she is the national field advisor with Our Climate. She is an earth steward through and through. Please give a warm welcome to Sharona. Thank you. That is really important to me, not only as an activist, but also as a human on this planet. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that clean air, nature, peace, and serenity are things that every human being should have a right to have, especially children on this earth, the ones currently growing up with a world that's full of uncertainty and chaos. But clean air, nature, peace, and serenity are the exact things that the kids at Harriet Tubman Middle School are being deprived of, deprived of selfishly by organizations like ODOT who see this freeway expansion simply as a means to an end. A freeway that furthers the heroin crisis that we face, that enables the emissions of toxic pollutants into the already highly polluted air. A freeway that not only interrupts the focus of these students trying to learn and devise a way out of the situation that they've been dealt but one that litters their backyard to boot. And it brings dirt and filth closer to the homes of these children and these families who are desperately trying to preserve what little that they have left that isn't already filled with trash and debris. ODOT should be ashamed, not only for allowing these kids, primarily youth of color, to struggle to breathe under the suffocation of their capitalism, but for also having the audacity to propose an action to expand this problem to strangle these kids and their futures even further. Thank you. All studies show that this worsened freeway air pollution will make these kids sick, lower their test scores, and give them higher rates of lifetime disability. If you're really listening right now and thinking to yourself, she's being dramatic. It's just a freeway, people just have places to be and need a way to get there. Well, the truth is I'm really not. I'm being realistic about the crisis that awaits us. Because when you're a person like myself, a BIPOC person on the front lines of this crisis, watching your future being fumbled in the hands of leaders who are laying a foundation guaranteed to crumble within your lifetime, all you'd want to do is scream. To scream that our governments are destroying our planet, our governments are selfishly prioritizing the status quo profits of ODOT's, ODOT and their preferred consultants, 
and that free, they're prioritizing the freight lobby over our clean air, safer streets, and human lives. Our, our government is bolstering decision making that systematically oppresses people like me, already bearing the brunt of this climate crisis, yet contributing the least to its development. Truly what's frustrating about this situation is knowing that these children can't even drive yet, yet they are the ones who have to breathe the polluted air caused by all of those passing by just feet away from their classrooms. In that sense, in that sense this issue for me and the climate crisis as a whole isn't just about a freeway or carbon emissions or pipelines, it's about a lack of morality. It's, a lot, it's about a lack of ethics in the system, a lack of consciousness, knowing that we have a choice to do the right or the wrong thing, but are consistently choosing to do the latter. What is right, what is just, is to ensure the sustainability of this planet for decades of generations to come. And what is wrong, is to continuously deplete its resources, to degrade air quality, and to allow certain groups to suffer from our actions more than others, and to selfishly prioritize money and short-term pleasures over the livelihood of our brothers and sisters. It's diabolical how easily this emergency is ignored and how quickly it becomes too late to take action. And it's disgusting that ODOT was caught knowingly manipulating traffic data and lying to the public that this freeway expansion would reduce air pollution, but in reality, that's just not something that freeway expansions do. So what can we do to prevent the wrong decision from being made to these innocent kids, to you, to I, and to all those that come after us? Personally, my solution has been taking matters into my own hands and starting a global movement called Tuesdays for Trash, which encourages everyone around the world to care for our planet and create a healthier home for everyone by picking up trash every week. Because, because what we found is that once you start picking up trash, you start to see it everywhere. And it not only turns into something that we can use to gain a sense of control over this overwhelming crisis, but it also inspires everyone around you to start taking action and that their individual actions matter. And we've seen this result by having not only seven chapters around the world, but also being able to see that 20 people, 20 countries around the world have started picking up trash because of us and we've already reached six out of seven continents in just under a year. But now let's bring it back, let's bring it back to ODOT because if I can do all of this as an individual with the little resources and platform that I have, then you have to be absolutely kidding me if you think you, ODOT, can't find a more sustainable way of reducing congestion on this freeway and helping these kids have a fu healthier future. <laughs> For one, you can scrap the idea of spending $800 million on any sort of freeway expansion because 40% of Oregon's carbon emissions come from transportation. What's even the point of any infrastructure investment that increases carbon emissions if we have only eight and a half years to act on the IPCC report that says we must dramatically reduce carbon emissions by 2030? Two, you can work towards the implementation of cleaner and more accessible public transportation to help reduce the amount of number of cars that are on the road while simultaneously limiting how much carbon is getting polluted into our atmosphere. And three, you can bring these communities on the front lines when making decisions that are directly affecting their livelihoods and on the conversation. You can make sure that they have a seat at the table so that you avoid the consequences of trying to make actions that are gonna determine their future without even asking them how they feel about it. Yeah. Frontline communities should be hired for green collar jobs that heal our community, clean our air, and save our planet not merely used by ODOT to justify freeway expansions that make our air more polluted. ODOT, this community will not remain silent, especially when innocent lives are at stake, nor when actions are being taken to worsen this crisis that's already looming over us. Climate leaders don't widen freeways. There is no room for compromise here. No freeway, no way. You'll hear us, you'll pay. <laughs>
applauding for Sharana. How awesome is that? Um, I also just want to say, uh, again, we please keep signing the postcards. We also have this banner that Sunrise PDX has put out that we are asking people to sign. Uh, we are going to go deliver it as public testimony to ODOT in the next couple weeks. So if you want to see the look on ODOT's face when, you know, there's a banner that has your name on it that says, please stop widening freeways, uh, we'd really appreciate you signing that as well. Um, one of the things that radicalized me about the Oregon Department of Transportation and freeway expansion was when I was involved with Oregon Walks, the pedestrian advocacy organization here in, in Oregon. Uh, and we would see all of these traffic fatalities happen on ODOT arterials in East Portland. And it would cost $100,000 at most to put in a crosswalk or a sidewalk. And ODOT didn't have the money for that on 82nd Avenue. ODOT still doesn't have the money for that. But ODOT does have $800 million for a freeway expansion. So uh, to talk a little bit more about traffic justice and traffic safety, uh, my good friend Izzy Armenta. Izzy is the Transportation Justice and Communications Manager at Oregon Walks. Oregon Walks is the pedestrian advocacy group celebrating 30 years of fighting for safe and accessible streets for all Oregonians. Give it up for Izzy. Can everyone hear me? All right. Thanks for coming out. It was sunny, but now it's a little darker. But it's all right. Um, so as everyone's saying, Oregon Walks is fighting Make it clear, Oregon Walks opposes the Bull Dock expansion of I-5 through the Rose Quarter. This has been touted as a safety project, but let's be clear, this isn't. Even ODOT status shows this stretch of highway is fairly safe of serious conditions and collisions compared to many other dangerous roads that ODOT owns and operates, specifically in East Portland. Thirteen people have been killed on 82nd Avenue since 2009, yet this project gets priority in $800 million. $800 million for a safety project while other ODOT roads in Portland are ignored and remain deadly. That money would be better used to address safety issues that currently exist. We also can't support a project that is grounded in a history that tore up a vibrant community and promises to shit back together. We are supposed to just take ODOT's word for it. This project also does not help us address our reality of dire climate change, but does the opposite. It's investing in fossil fuel infrastructure when it can be used to improve and increase transit options and provide individuals more options getting around in our region. Given that we know transportation accounts for 40% of our total carbon emissions, we cannot support any plan that proposes to add to those staggering numbers. The project also does nothing to improve congestion. Even ODOT's data suggests it will do little or nothing to improve congestion. So this project does not improve safety does not relieve congestion, or does not help us get closer to our climate goals. So why are we funding it? Thank you. All right, thank you, Izzy. Um, so next up, we have another one of our co-plaintiffs on the lawsuit. Uh, we have Alan Rudwick, who is the co-chair of the LA Neighborhood Association. Um, Alan has been fighting the Rose Quarter Freeway expansion for over a decade. Uh, the Elliott Neighborhood Association has been just remarkably tenacious on this, uh, and we are honored to welcome him to the stage. All right, give it up for Alan. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Elliott. Wow. So this this neighborhood has seen a lot. I've been doing some of my, some research to educate myself. And uh, some of the stats are shocking. Two-thirds of the population, from 12,000 down to 4,000, of the area between, south of Fremont down to, like, on this side of Vancouver, down to the river, was lost over the course of ODOT, PDC, and Emanuel Hospital taking various chunks of housing and removing it from the neighborhood. Two-thirds. More than half of those people were black, and the amount of wealth that would have existed had those houses stayed is incomprehensible. This, this project is sometimes pushed as like a benefit to minorities. Creating jobs for some people is not creating wealth for people. People can find a different job. You can't find different wealth. You can't. There's many pages of 
this history documented in the back of the environment, the in documents that ODOT has put out. But what was it, Aaron? You can't uh, solve it. Uh, damn it! I lost my line. All right. You can't do uh, fix history if you don't if you keep sweeping under the rug. <laughs> so ODOT has already tried to widen the highway here multiple times. There was a project called the Greeley Banfield Project, which is a little bit more audacious. But ultimately, they think they have a problem. They, they think the highway is too narrow. They came to us with a wider highway, and they've been spending close to 10 years trying to dress it up in a way that would be palatable for the general public. And I wanted to invite the former land use chair of Elliott up to talk about all the shenanigans that have been going on with the public process to show how no one has ever voted for this project to go forward. So I'd like to introduce Mike Warwick. Hi. Uh, I live in this neighborhood and have been here for over 40 years. Moved here in the 70s. Uh, was one of a handful of people that started the Elliott Neighborhood Association to fight against the city practices for the most part. And that uh, led me to all kinds of positions in the neighborhood associations, Alan said, neighborhood chair, land use chair, on and off for decades. Because it's hard to get volunteers that are willing to spend that kind of time. Uh, but I'm pretty well versed in this. And one of the things that happens if you do these jobs long enough, people get to say, hey, we should get a neighborhood representative on our committee to look at MLK. And I was on that committee twice for the city and the state. Uh, and uh, 10 years ago, or actually 12 years ago, for the uh, city's Northwest Quad Northeast Quadrant Plan, which was a comprehensive part of the Portland's comprehensive plan process, which it has to do every 20 years. Um, uh, ODOT threw a bunch of money into the Northeast Quadrant Plan to make it the, you know, a, a zoning and transportation plan. They had a reason for that, and the city was happy to take the money because they could do more with it. What the city wanted to do was look at surface transportation improvements for pedestrians, bikes, uh, that kind of stuff. What ODOT wanted to do was look at the freeway. Uh, and they had a powerful motivation for doing that, so they formed this Citizens Advisory Committee to work on both the zoning and the transportation plan. They had representatives from all of the close-in neighborhoods uh, on that committee. And interestingly enough, when we got to the first meeting, about every neighborhood representative had an equivalent from the trucking industry. <laughs> okay, so this is how process works. They had the people who were the constituents for the project to balance out the citizens who might not support the project. And that's the way that process played out. It took three years to get the plan out when we got down to it. None of the neighborhood representatives supported the project, but the story that we were told was you can't get any of the surface improvements unless this project goes because it's all tied up in the uh, Metro 2020 transportation uh, plan. That money has to be tied to a specific project. So here's the project we're going to tie it to. It's roughly $400,000 project, which is, of course, a joke. But, uh, and it's not well designed yet, so there's a lot of room for changes. So we said we will consent to saying this should be part of the plan under the condition that when it gets designed, it comes back to us to review it, not after you design the whole thing and there's no opportunity to change it, but as those plans evolve so we can see how this works, because we had a lot of objections to it. They said, oh, sure, no problem. Plans got done, got filed, got uh, went away. Next time we heard from them, they said, oh, I heard from them. They said, we need another uh, in, uh, citizen advisory committee to to uh, explain this project to the neighborhood. I said, well, you know, the neighborhood doesn't like this project. Well, yeah, but we need to have the neighborhood perspective to understand how we can, uh, you know, basically put lipstick on this big. And so once again, we had the committee, everybody on the committee from the neighborhood says, we hate this project. We are not going to help you whitewash it. So they disbanded the committee. Now they've started a third one. 
Okay? So they've gone through all the reputable, well, I don't want to say that because some of those people on the current committee are not you know, you know, reputable, but the, the big name uh, representatives in the neighborhood who said no to this project well, won't have anything to do with it anymore. So they're kind of trying to pick, hand pick people that they think will say yes. So the key thing in this from all, that all of you should know is when you come out and you say, oh, there's a community advisory committee that says it's a great project, is don't believe it. Do not believe it. These folks are liars. Pretty much that's my closing comment. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's humbling to hear from folks that have been fighting this project for a decade, uh, confirm what folks that have just been paying attention in the last couple weeks and months. It doesn't seem like we can trust the Oregon Department of Transportation. Um, and, and as we are having this conversation, it's important for us to acknowledge like what's at stake here, right? And, and next up is someone who I think can speak uh, really articulately to that. Um, so Gerald D. Scretchens is a social sciences public educator who instructs at Grant High School. Uh, and he is, he is a co-founder of the Harriet Tubman Middle School Environmental Justice Club and a co-organizer of Grant's 2020 Environmental Justice Club. When not working, Scretch serves on numerous nonprofit boards, including the Eco School Network and Flex and Flows Activist Board. He's going to tell me if I pronounced that correctly. A health and wellness nonprofit that strives to improve the equity and access of BIPOC members of the yoga and wellness community. Mr. Scrutchins holds a 30 hour yoga tr teaching certificate and instructs yoga at Flex and Flow PDX. Why have I not been doing yoga with Scrutch on Zoom over the last year? Mr. Scrutchins enjoys traveling with his family, trail running, and reading. Please give it up for Mr. Scrutchins. All right, can everyone hear me out there? Excellent, uh, thank you so much for showing up to the space. Thank you for holding space, everyone. If we could, uh, there's something that we, we do not do enough, and I would like to start this way, just to just reunify us all. Can we all just sit for a moment and take three breaths? Just empty out your lungs, take an inhale for a four or five count, and slowly exhale. Just allow yourself to reground. Allow yourself to come back to this space, to the present moment. Oftentimes I have to come back and reground as I learn about the history, the atrocities, the genocide that was committed in the establishment of this empire. I find myself just not breathing in disbelief. So I would just like to start there with you all. One of the first items on my agenda when I arrived here at Harriet Tubman Middle School, when we were allowed to leave our professional development and go and check out classes freely, I walked to the southwest corner of the school and I started counting the number of diesel trucks that passed by in one moment. I knew those diesel trucks had no filtration system on there because I had listened to Mary Pivotal and Neighbors for Clean Air. In that minute, in that morning, I counted around 15. Doing the math, I took that 15, multiplied it by 60, multiplied it again by 24, and taking a conservative estimate, I came up with about 10,000 diesel trucks passing a day on the busiest part of I-5 on the West Coast. I knew exactly what was at stake. We are in a school that claims to have the cleanest air quality in the city of Portland. However, we sealed the windows shut. Outside of that school is some of the worst air quality in the country. And we were asking our students, our kids, our youth, to go and play outside, go outside for recess, right against this freeway, right here, all right? There's a quote from uh, Portland activists 
and writer Tria Autry. She says, if they come for me at night, they will be coming for you in the morning. And that is exactly how capitalism works. No one is safe, no land is safe. So I want you to repeat after me. We're going to say this three times. Climate, or no, it's backwards. Capitalism versus climate. Say it. Capitalism versus climate. Capitalism versus climate. Now let's talk about capitalism versus humans. Because that's what it has been since day one, since the establishment, since the importing of abducted, dehumanized bodies from Africa to the port of Charleston, to 12 generations of my ancestors working for this institution in the fields, to the mines after slavery, to the convict leasing systems that ran throughout the South. It's always been about profit. It's always been about exploiting brown and black people, working class white people. It has not changed. I first came to this neighborhood in 2003 as an undergraduate student delivering pizzas, one of my first jobs in Portland. And I entered the area of Albina on Mississippi Avenue, and I looked around, I was like, oh, this is, this is a different part of Portland. Like, I can feel this vibe a little bit, being a person from Chicagoland. It was definitely different from the rest of Portland. Within a couple years, my partner and I and a couple roommates, we moved up to this area because we felt more comfortable in this area. And the change was slowly starting then. We left to attend graduate school, came back in 2009, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I couldn't believe what had happened to the Mississippi district and how fast it had changed, how fast people had been pushed out. And it's this school, Harriet Tubman, right? Our Minta Harriet Ross, also known as Minty. We know her as Harriet Tubman. We are in the legacy of a woman who emancipated herself. She returned to the South to rescue her family members, to rescue other people. She was the first woman to lead an expedition for the Union Army to rescue over 300 slaves at once. But we can't even honor her. We can't honor her name in this building. This school has been opened and closed three times. Why, why, why? Because it's expendable. It's expendable because we've exploited the community. We've been exploiting this community for over 50 years. There's barely anything left of it. So I don't want to go on too much because as, as a teacher, I'll, I'll just keep talking. But what I want to do is shift the focus now. I want to shift the focus to my first year here and working with a group of students. And this work just first started as, hey, you all want to come in and meet at lunch and we will talk about the young people's history of the United States. And I gathered with this group of students, started up with about 10 or 12 students. And we were reading one, two, three chapters. And what I realized, I said, this is a motivated group of students, a motivated group of students. And one day when we met, I closed the book and I said, do you all want to take on some activism? And this is serious work. This is beginning to reclaim this neighborhood. This is beginning to work on your futures, as well as my children's futures and their children's futures. From there, we begin to work with Neighbors for Clean Air on HB 2007. We learned how to speak proactively. We learned about the dangers in this neighborhood and what their classmates were facing on a daily basis. Within five months, we were lobbying down at the state capitol. 
Within two months after that, students were speaking in front of Metro Regional Council. Thank you. And what's so strange is that sometimes people say, Scratch, you're doing great work with the kids. They're doing great work with me. They are the ones that are moving forward. They are the ones that are standing up to the greedy, selfish capitalist. Right? So, um, one thing that I want to end here with is a quote from one of my favorite human rights activists, James Baldwin. He says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And it is time to face the people who want to place profits before you all, before your children, before my children, and we have to work together to do this. So I thank you so much for just listening to me for a moment. Please take this energy and carry it forward because the work is just beginning. Thank you. All right, how is everybody doing right now? Are we feeling good? I know it got a little chilly, but we're still here. Uh, so now we're for the, uh, the Grand Marquis of the evening. Um, I, sorry, I, sh I should have waited for Tolman to put his coat on before I kept speaking. Uh, the Grand Marquis of the evening, uh, Mr. Scrutchins was talking about the student leadership and how thoughtful and brave they were. So we figured we should close out the evening with giving the Harriet Tubman uh, Environmental Justice Club a chance to speak some truth to power. So uh, next up, we have two uh, ninth grade students at Grant High School, former members of the Tubman Environmental Justice Club. Please give a loud welcome to Ada Crandall and Melina Ewan. for being here. My name is Ada and this is Melina. We're both freshmen at Grant High School and we're also former Tubman students. When Melina and I were in seventh grade, Mr. Scrutchins told us that our middle school had some of the worst air pollution in the entire state. But to be honest, that didn't come as much of a surprise. When we would bike to school, it would be, oh, there's Dawson Park or there's the community center and oh, there's the busiest part of the I-5 corridor. We are faced with this freeway and the destruction it brings no matter what. So for us and our friends and our classmates and our teachers, there's no choice to say, oh, let's put this issue to the side right now. That was not an option. Because thousands of diesel trucks pass by the building every single day. And because of their emissions, we could literally see the smog in the air during recess. And on bad days, kids with asthma were afraid to even come outside. This freeway is constantly on our minds, and it is in our lungs, and it is a direct threat to the heart of the Tubman community. And all of that is just right now. It doesn't take an expert to see that adding more lanes to I-5 means more people driving. And more people driving means more pollution in the backyard of Harriet Tubman Middle School and in the Albina neighborhood. Even the current sixth graders at Tubman can understand this concept of induced demand. And for some reason, ODOT still cannot. <laughs> what ODOT is proposing is an $800 million plan to take the freeway that's already literally making Tubman students sick and moving it even closer to the school. Aid and I don't go to Tubman anymore, but that doesn't make us any less concerned. We are worried for the future and for the safety of generations of students to come. We want them to be able to go outside and see trees and grass in a beautiful blue sky, not huge diesel trucks on a freeway that's so close to the school, it may as well be our playground. We don't want them to have to worry about whether or not the air that they're breathing at recess will one day lead to asthma or lung cancer. These are not big asks. Tubman students and the Albina neighborhood should not be denied the basic right to clean air. 
we shouldn't need to miss class to show up at ODOT meetings just to tell them that our classmates deserve to breathe. I don't understand how in the face of a climate crisis, we are still trying to convince our government that they shouldn't expand a freeway into a school. We also know that the situation at Tumman is a lot more than just an environmental problem. We know it's not a coincidence that the richer, predominantly white schools on the west side are not dealing with the same issues as Tubman, a school that serves over 60% students of color. Time and time again, black, brown, and indigenous people have been disproportionately affected by climate disasters and targeted by racist city, po city planning policies. And the Rose Quarter Freeway expansion is just one example of this. no way ODOT can claim that this freeway expansion is restorative justice when the original construction of I-5 is what displaced many original Albina residents in the first place and when the existing freeway is literally giving Tubman students asthma. Restorative justice requires healing the harm caused, not spending millions to widen the harm even further. We're excited about the proposals put forth by the Albina Vision Trust and the ideas of capping the freeway, but all of these things can be done without expanding the structure that is causing the harm. Many of us grew up hearing that Portland was such a green, sustainable city, and in some ways it is, but ultimately we have been lied to. How can, we, how can our leaders call themselves sustainable and say that they stand for climate justice, but then turn around and continue to support projects like this that value profit and economic growth over the safety, education, and well-being of Portland's youth? Already, 40% of Oregon's carbon emissions come from transportation. We are in the middle of a climate crisis and we are running out of time. We are running out of time and what ODA is proposing is to pay $800 million for a huge step in the wrong direction. $800 million to further environmental damage and climate destruction. $800 million for a plan that in the long run won't solve anything at all. The current best available science says that we have less than 10 years to take serious action against climate change. We need green jobs, affordable housing, public transportation. We need a livable future. We need leaders who will fight for the justice and liberation of all people, not just those who will profit off expanding a toxic freeway into this school. We're here today to tell ODOT that freeway expansion is not justice. Increasing pollution is not justice. Empty promises are not justice. We are here today to tell ODOT that their false data and manipulation are no match for the power we hold as students, educators, and community members. We refuse to let ODOT's greed and lies destroy our futures and further pollute this neighborhood. As youth climate leaders, we're sick of being told that we are inspiring. Our officials can say that they support us, but we don't want their support. We want their action. And if they're not prepared to act, they need to step aside and make room for the people who are. Our futures and the future of the entire Tubman community is at stake here. With your help, we can demand ODOT conduct a full environmental impact statement on the I-5 freeway expansion because it is the only way to guarantee the protection of our lungs, our communities, and our planet. Climate leaders, don't widen freeways. Thank you. Yeah, keep applauding, right? Come on. They are ninth graders. Isn't that outrageous? Uh, 
So we've got a bunch of thank yous, and I have a short remark, and then everyone gets to go put on another layer of, of clothing and go home, if that's, a, if that's cool with folks, all right? Um, we got a bunch of thank yous. So first, thank you to all of our speakers. We had Tad, Tori, Izzy, Sharona, Alan, Ada, Melina, Joe, and Mr. Scrutchins. Please, another round of applause for all of our speakers. We've had so many volunteers just over the last month uh, putting this event together, helping line up all of these details. Among them, Joan, Hazel, Kristen, Robin, Maria, and our Sunrise Art Crew, um, Elaine, Pauline, Hannah. Please, just a round of applause, and thank you for everybody. <laughs> Emily Geis putting out the, the social media, Maddie Mashker. Uh, I want to thank Portland Public Schools for allowing us to, uh, to camp out today. Uh, this is the largest uh, group of people that has been at a PPS facility in a very long time. Um, <laughs> And, and thank you very much to the Tubman community and to PPS staff for allowing us to be here. Um, I want to thank, thank Snack Block. Th Snack Block. Uh, please look them up on PayPal or Venmo or uh, Cash App. I, I don't know how the kids are handing out money these days. Um, thank you to, uh, fingers crossed, uh, Andrew Tolman and our ASL. Uh, thank you to Dan and Peter for doing our video live stream and our uh, audio system today. This is so awesome that we're able to stream this live. I know a lot of people wanted to be here but couldn't. Um, we had some speakers that wanted to be here today, but mercifully, wonderfully, this is great news. They just got you know their second shot with the vaccine. I know a lot of people, uh, we're all healing, we're all getting better. And some folks weren't able to be here today, but thank you very much for our audio visual team. Um, and we have, I have one participatory thank you, um, and he doesn't know that we're about to do this. Uh, we are all here for many reasons, and many people have played an enormous role. We stand on so many shoulders. Uh, there's one individual in particular that uh, sent an email in August of 2017 and said, hey, do you guys want to fight the Rose Quarter for project? Uh, and Chris Smith happens to have a birthday next week. Look at it, he's laughing, he's been hiding out over here. Uh, so we're going to sing you happy birthday, Chris. I asked Stacy, and that's actually how I used it to make sure that Stacy allowed you to come out. So is everyone ready to sing happy birthday to Chris for a moment? Yeah. All right. I'm not going to use the mic because you don't want to hear me sing on the microphone. But ready? Happy birthday to you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so I, <laughs> I'm angry that we all have to be here, but I'm so grateful that we are all here and that the words of wisdom, compassion, vulnerability, and moral clarity we've heard today can inspire us to continue to fight for community resilience. The freeway fight is an opportunity for all of us to assemble what's best about our community, a commitment to fighting anti-blackness and white supremacy, fighting for a just transition, for safer streets, for cleaner air, for a healthier planet, and it's against about what's worst of our community, the status quo governments, the capitalism, the corruption, the lying, the data manipulation, the people taking the paycheck to you know, move something forward and finding ways to justify what we know to be blatantly wrong and a trespass against a neighborhood on land that's been stolen at least twice already. Um, in closing, I wanna talk about one of my favorite parts of Portland and a story that hopefully we can share and think about in the months ahead. Um, who here in the last couple weeks has been on the waterfront and visited the cherry blossoms this spring? Based on Instagram, I think all of you. I've, I've seen all of you in front of those cherry blossoms. Um, especially after the year we've had of being locked at home, worried about the wildfire smoke, worried about our loved ones, worried about COVID, worried about police brutality, worried about all of those that are most vulnerable and everything that 2020 was throwing at us. It's been such a sigh of relief to see those beautiful pink blossoms and to see that despite everything, we're still blossoming, we're recovering, we're resilient, we're getting those shots, spring is here. It hasn't rained in the last week. It's just been so great for my own personal mental health and I can imagine it's the same for many of you. That stretch of the Tom McCall Waterfront Park is a potent reminder of all that we've had to survive and the decisions that we must make and have been made in the past about what we want our future, what we inspire and hope that our community will look like. Those cherry blossoms that we've all been taking photos of in front of on Instagram, they were first planted in 1990 as part of a larger memorial to honor the Japanese American internments during World War II. 
To quote a judge who is speaking at the ribbon cutting, without this memorial, without a physical gesture of remembrance, we can, we may, we will forget. Already the Japanese internment experience is hardly noted in civic textbooks and in history books. It is barely a footnote in college history courses, and even it is not mentioned at all in most law schools. Yet this is the story, the story that is represented by the memorial we dedicate today that must not and cannot be lost. And, you know, given the rise of cri hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the last year, it feels all the more relevant to bask in the beauty of those blossoms and reflect on the need to eradicate white supremacy wherever it hides in our culture and society, in our racist urban planning decisions, in notions that some communities are disposable because the freeway was already there. I'll also point out, of course, that this stretch of waterfront where we're all taking those Instagram photos, it was originally a highway. The Oregon Highway Department, before it was rebranded as the Oregon Department of Transportation, had torn out the buildings along the waterfront and replaced it with a harbor drive, a large highway. Thanks to activists in the 70s that called themselves the waterfront for people, they held picnics in the road as civil disobedience. And they eventually built the political power to tear out harbor drive and replace it with a linear park. That was unprecedented at the time for municipal American politics to be saying, we don't want more roads, we want more green space, we want to access the river. It's not a sign of just industry and pollution. It's a sign, it's, it's Oregon, it's our nature. Um, every, today, every time you were looking at those cherry blossoms, if you're biking to work, if you're walking up to the, down to celebrate any of the events that happened in the summer, we were given the opportunity to reflect on whether we want to build a city for people, whether we can admire the beauty of those blossoms and that memorial that we discussed, or if we're building a city for cars, if the city is a place to come to and come together, or if it's a place to pass through. These are choices that all of us collectively have to make. And we'll have to build power so politicians are forced to grapple with the consequences of this decision time and time again. And finally, to tie it all together, those cherry blossoms to me also reflect the urgency of the climate crisis that we've been facing. The blossoming of cherry blossoms in Japan it's, it's like a national holiday. The entire country shuts down for two weeks. I was lucky enough, uh, my dad and I went to Japan when I was in high school towards the end of the blossom. The, the country shuts down and everyone goes and wanders through the park blossoms and, and processes the beauty and, and the transience and this ephemeral, how fortunate we are to be blessed on this planet that has living life around us. Um, and this year, arborists in Kyoto saw the earliest cherry blossom season in 1,209 years. 1,209 years. This is, of course, due to the rising temperatures on this planet that has a changing climate that is caused by carbon emissions. 40% of Oregon's carbon emissions come from transportation. If we do not stop ODOT's disastrous plans for the Rose Quarter Freeway expansion, literally in the backyard of Harriet Tubman Middle School, and the other freeway expansions ODOT has lined up all over the region. Everything else that we are building and recovering from essentially goes out the window in the next decade. What is even the point? What are we doing here? This is an existential moment, and I'm asking you to deeply reflect on how much you appreciate those cherry blossoms and the ephemeral nature, and how those cherry blossoms are speaking to us by moving forward every week. This is a climate emergency. We do not have time to wait. We need action. It's a desperate plea. They are opening earlier and earlier every year, begging us to rethink our stewardship of this planet and to lower our carbon emissions. So yeah, when you see those cherry blossoms on the waterfront or throughout the Albina neighborhood, there were many planted in this neighborhood as part of a restorative effort that unfortunately through the displacement and gentrification, many of the original families that planted them in this neighborhood are no longer able to live here. Don't just take that Instagram selfie, although please take those Instagram selfies. I love scrolling through them. I'm happy to see people are getting out. But we have to listen to those messages that those cherry blossoms are trying to tell us and that previous generations that planted those cherry blossoms are trying to tell us and that the planet itself is trying to tell us. We have to eradicate white supremacy that pri prioritize the movement of white suburban automobiles over the lungs of a majority non-white school. We must build our community full of spaces where we can enjoy the river, enjoy nature, sit next to each other while not in traffic. And we have to remove the spaces for cars that continue to rob us of the city space we need for housing and parks. And we must listen to the earth and the living plants around us urging us to take notice that we're running out of time before those blossoms that remind us of the joys on this planet and those that we have lost, before they too are lost entirely. So I hope you all enjoy me, join me in, in 
joining and in, in, enjoying the return of spring, celebrating the return of spring, the return of the cherry blossoms, and the return of a community-led advocacy in opposition to the Oregon Department of Transportation, all for our greater future. Climate leaders, do not widen freeways. Okay, the event's over, I can like breathe a little bit. Um, uh, thank you all very, very, very much for being here. It warms my heart. Um, we have a couple hundred more postcards. We have a couple more. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Uh, we have a couple more postcards. If you felt inspired by something that happened here today, um, please sign up to learn more about No More Freeways. We will be continuing to fight freeway expansions in the weeks and months and years ahead. Our elected officials need to hear what you felt today. So please write a postcard. Please join our mailing list. Please get involved. Um, and, and please support your local effort to abolish the freeway industrial complex. Thank you all very much for your time. Please get home safely.